evening my fellow booktubers. So I normally don't do a nighttime video because um I feel like with the lighting with you know with well actually now that I'm looking and what you know looking in the camera I figure it's not I there's nothing wrong with filming in the evening as long as I'm not in my PJs. Although I've done a couple of videos in my PJs. But I just decided to go ahead and film my what I'm going to read on my day off and what I'm currently reading. Since, you know, there's always that small, there's that fear that they might call me and then basically, oh, this won't matter and I'll have to cancel my plans anyway, my reading plans anyway. Um, although I could say, because I mean, I'm not scheduled to go to work tomorrow, so I could technically say no that I'm not available. And... In a way, there are some difficulties tomorrow because I'm, my dad, at last minute, he is he has to go out of town tomorrow. It's kind of a last minute decision. And then my mom, what she her schedule is, she'll work either Thursday, Friday, or Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and um, like goes in in the mid morning, and then comes home late in the evening, like eleven around like eleven ish. And then she's always off on Wednesdays, and she's always off on the weekends. So tomorrow she'll be working. So it's kind of, I mean, I could take Uber if they did call me, but I would be more tempted to say that I didn't, I had a transportation issue. So, um, if they did call me. But I'm always, I'm always paranoid that they're, all my days off, I'm always paranoid that they're gonna, they're gonna ask me to come in. So I thought, like I said, I thought I would just go ahead and film my video tonight and talk about what I'm going to read tomorrow and what I'm currently reading. But I finished, yay, I finally finished this book, um, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith, which I'm not going to really say much because I'm going to do um, my review of this book. I'm going to probably film that tomorrow at some point. But um, this is basically a coming of age story set during the 19th. 1900 early 1900s and it's about this um this irish girl francine nolan with it's her her mom her dad and her her little brother and then eventually she has another another little sibling a uh, sister um and it's about their lives and how their heart the hardships that they go through living in brooklyn and how they are very poor and people are constantly judging them because of that and how they they have to work a lot harder like at one point when Francine is 14 years old she has to start working it's either going to school or working and because they can't afford it she needs to go to work she can't go to school and but her brother can and there's so many experiences Francie goes through like personal experience and then light you know experiences that the whole world goes through that she we see through her eyes and there's a bit that her um her mom has to you know work like extremely hard too hard for um for necessary and her father is a drunk but she you know she loves him more than anything and it's just it's so she goes her and her family go through so much and they still survive and this is not a sweet this is it's a sweet it's like not a story that's all like, I don't want to say the same word that I'm thinking about using my review, but it's not very sugar-coated. It's not all sweet and stuff. It's like, no matter how good these Francie and her parents, her, no matter how good and hardworking Francie is, she still has to crawl her way up to the, you know, to survive. And that's what she, le that's what she learned, then that's what this book is about. And, you know, it's a very long book. And it's not, you know, it's a, someone's life story, so it's not always, it's not like, like Mistborn, as far as plot goes. So, um, I'm gonna probably talk, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in my, in my, per, my individual review. Hopefully, um, but hopefully I'll be able to say a lot more I, that I didn't just say everything I want to say. Hopefully I'll have more to say when I film that review. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I gave it, um, I thought it was good. 
now, so now I can get back to, um, reading the first, I'm still working my way through, and I'm pretty sure I can get this done before, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get it done, because I don't have much longer, I mean, like, I don't have much longer to read, um, just as long as I don't take a really long break in between the readings and continue to read it, um, so much is going, so much is going on, and so much is being revealed, and you're just, and so I want to know what's going to happen. And I think I got a little spoiled for what's going to happen to our main characters a little bit. But I don't know the exact method of how this is going to happen. But I, I mean, so, like, I don't know entirely what's going to happen. But I think I got a little hint of what's going to happen. Like, not, like I said, not the exact details. But, um, like, of course... I didn't know that person was going to spoil them. They didn't know that I hadn't read the book yet. So, I mean, they don't know this person doesn't know me personally. So, how could they know? And how could I know? So, it's just a little unfortunate accident. And it's like so much is happening. And I just, I just cannot wait to, you know, I love, I really enjoy Brandon Sanderson's work. I'm enjoying, like, I'm just getting so engaged. I'm so engaged in his this trilogy, this story, and I just and I'm definitely not one of those people who can who like either. I don't know if it's just me or if it's like the book, the whole book. I mean, we definitely know that Brandon Sanderson is an amazing writer, and that he turned he twists tropes and creates this engaging story. But I don't like. I don't know if I'm just not very good at guessing or if it's just that he is that good. Because I don't have any idea. I, I mean, except with the getting spoiled a little bit, I don't know what's going to happen. And I love that. I'm just, I'm, you know. I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm, but I'm going to read this tomorrow. I'm going to read a little bit of this. And I think this might be the book I might read tonight. Um... I always have to pick a book that's, like, modern and easy to read when I read in bed. Because, some because you know, with those, cl like, classics, I can't read those in bed because I'll end up falling asleep. You know, even if they're not, even if I don't find them boring, even if I am engaged in the story, if I'm tired, then I'm going to be reading the same sentence all over again with... This and because his chap, some of his chapters, a lot of his chapters are short, so hopefully I'll be able to. Or there's at least a page break. Like if this was a TV show, there would be the com there would be commercial breaks. Um, so it's just it would be it's an easier book to read than two of the other books that I have that I have here that you can't see. I can those two I won't I wouldn't be able to read in bed, but this one I'm pretty sure I can read in bed. Like, at least read a chapter or two. Ideally, uh, three or four chapters. But I think safe as bad is that I'll probably only get through one or two chapters before I fall, before I start falling asleep. So, yeah, I'm going to read this tonight at midnight. So it will technically be tomorrow when, the, when it's midnight. So this is the very first book I'll read tomorrow. And then I'll probably, what I'm going to, I'm going to, um, because I have two bags full of books that I'm going to donate. So I'm going to stop. I'm probably going to go to the Givens bookstore tomorrow. Probably buy at least one book. Because unfortunately, like most booktubers, I have a bit of a problem. I have very little self-control. I mean, it's like the only way that I don't want to buy a book is if I never go to, if I don't go into the Givens bookstore and I just go to the library. Um, but like I said, I'm what I've decided I'm going to do is I'm going to read, I think, well, actually, I've already said this. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm still continuing trying to read twenty books from my own personal collection here, my own personal library. I'm, I'm gonna read twenty books, and um, once I get twenty books read, well, actually, ten books now because I've read. Well, um, once I get ten books read, ten more, ten more books read, then maybe I'll start going to the library again. Although there are some books that I'm thinking about that are books that I wouldn't necessarily buy for myself, but if they have them at the library, I'll borrow them 
because I am interested in them, but not so interested that I have to buy them. So I'm gonna, um, so when I go to the Gibbons bookstore, I'm probably bring this book with me along with quite a few others. Probably, I don't know if I'm gonna bring the other two that I'm gonna show you guys in this video or not. So I'm gonna read that tomorrow. And then I finally, I got back into reading I Capture the Castle, and I think I'm a little more than, um, and I think there are only, if I count, if I looked, if I read the Roman numerals right, then there's 16 chapters in this book. Um, so it's really, it's not a long, uh, ah, it's not a long book, it's just the chapters are, but the individual chapters are long, because they're journal, and they're, in a way, they're journal entries. They're, I mean, they're not like, dear diary, blah, 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 it's just, we're hearing, I mean, we're, we are hearing the main character's thoughts, she's narrating the story, and then she says, I go write in my journal every so often. But this is a, a, a I get. I don't know if this is considered a modern classic or a literary book. Um, I guess because I don't know if it's a classic or not. But this is um, I captured cash by Doty Doty Smith. Um, this is a story of Cassandra and her family. She has her um. And they, her father has had, chooses to have them live in this abandoned castle. And it's about all their, their lives there and how the people, the owner, the landlords of their home, they meet the two of the, they meet them, um, and they're American. And the, Cassandra's older sister sets her sight, uh, one of the brothers, Simon, thinking that she'll get him to marry her. Because, of course, this is still, I don't, I mean, it says... I don't know what year this is supposed to be set in, but she sets her sights on si Rose, sets her sights on Simon, despite the fact that she doesn't like his beard. <laughs> She's like obsessed with that thing. Um, and it's kind of like an observed, and it's observed through Cassandra, her father, and stepmom, Topaz, and... She, and it, we also, in, in the back description, it also talks about how she falls in love for the first time. And I still don't figure out who it's going to be, who she's going to fall in love with. It's either going to be Stephen, who is kind of like, I, I think, I guess he's a servant for the family, and he likes her. He has feelings for Cassandra. But then I'm wondering, is it going to be Neil, the other brother? Is he going to be the love of interest? I'm still not sure. Or maybe it's going to be a love, it might be a love triangle. I don't know. But either way, it's a very good, um, I love reading, like, I don't, I'm not, okay, so I'm very picky about my first person narrative. I don't like reading first person narrative when it's in the 20th, late 20th century, early 21st century, like, in contemporary novels. I don't care much for a first person narrative. I mean, unless it's like, well, actually, I don't mind it so much if it's from someone in my age group as an adult, but if it's a teenager, a contemporary teenager, then I'm not as big a fan of it. Um, but I like when first person narrative when it's a historical setting, and I'm talking like before the fifties. When I say historical, that's like especially like the Victorian period, like the. 17 or 1800s, or even the 20s, possibly. Like, more so the 19th century than anything. But I think because our, our, our grasp of the English language is so much more different today. Like, the way we speak today is so much more... I can't really explain it, but just the way we speak is, like, there's more... We use more slang were more, like, instead of speak, we say talk, or, you know, like, I'm, I'm on Facebook, and I do this too, but when I'm on Facebook, people don't pay attention to, the, to their grammar, and, um, like, Terry from Florida will 
constantly and I hope she does not see this video. If she does see it, I'm sorry, but it does drive me a little, it does annoy me. Not that, and no, if, you, if she sees this, I hope she knows that, no, I am aware of my grammatical errors. It just drives me crazy when it should be like, when she's using, when she says to, but she's referring to something also, something else happening. Or something happening as well. It's, you know, you know how grammatically it's supposed to be T-O-O. -O, not T-O. Like, T-O is going to the store. Or, um, and then, like, when you say, like, me too. Like, the me too movement, it's me too, as in me also. It's T-O-O. -O, and it just, it, it kind of, it bugs me. <laughs> And then also when she, um, and then, like, she, when it should be doesn't, or, like, she uses don't all the time when it should be, like, doesn't, or something. I'm trying to, there's the other word where she says don't when it should be the other word. Um, but yes, it's just when I see people's grammatical errors, like, not that I'm a snob or anything, and I don't, I'm not trying to sound like a snob or sound like I'm so superior with the English language because I'm not. And like I said, I'm aware that I make a lot of grammatical errors, particularly on Facebook, because of course on Facebook, I think it's in, on any, you know, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, or even a comment on here on YouTube, people don't always pay attention to their grammar. And, you know, my parents have always drilled into my head. I mean, even on Facebook, my mom would tell me, you know, she's read through my Facebook comments and stuff, and she feels like, she's like, you need to correct yourself, that's, you don't speak in proper English, but, and now I've, <laughs> even though at the time, I was like, kind of, I am in, I was kind of rolling my eyes, and being like, and the sort of thing we say, like, you mean like, or, you know, we say like, or you know, a lot. <laughs> And I try not to, but I am, it's a hard habit to break. But I was getting, she went, you know, I was rolling my eyes, you know, because I was kind of wrong, because I'm like, oh, no one on Facebook pay t pays attention to that. No one cares on Facebook as long as, but it is true that if you don't speak improper, if you, you know, if you don't have the right grammar, sometimes people misunderstand you if you forget a word. Or something, you know, people can tend, can misunderstand and misinterpret what you're saying on Facebook so easily because they're not, they don't hang out with you except for on Facebook and you're not interacting in person on there. So it's easy to misinterpret things. And I've gotten in trouble a couple times. But, um, yeah, I just, basically, long story short, I love how people spoke back in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Well, maybe not so much early 20th century, because of the 20th cent early 20th century. Well, I mean, they still have a bit of elegant elegance and proper English back in, like, the 20s, and, you know. But that's when slang started. I mean, although I'm pretty sure they always had slang, but as I'm telling you, it's slang that I'm, familiar, that I'm familiar with in a way, in some way, even though it's different from today's modern slang. Like, people don't say bees knees anymore. You know, and people in, like, the, you know, 60s and 70s, they were, like, psychedelic and neato and, and all that kind of stuff. And, like, the 80s, I think people used the word awesome, although we use awesome today. But, yeah, it's it's just so different. And that's why I love reading historical fiction or classics because I just, like, as much as I don't always appreciate or can always get into a Jane Austen novel, for instance, I love the way it's written. And the beautiful prose, even though I'm thinking, oh my god, she, why, why can't she just simplify what she's saying? Why can't she say, they took a walk, or, you know, they, or she didn't think he was that great of a person, or whatever, you know. Part of me, because I'm a modern reader, part of me is still, think, still thinks like that. But then another part is like, oh, this is so beautiful. I feel smart already reading this, just by reading this. You know, and I just, sometimes I just love hearing myself speak the English that is written in the story, in a classic novel. It's just so enriching and so beautiful sounding.
which is why I kind of do like flowery language to an extent. But I also have to, I also have to be in a way that under, I understand it. But like this. But I'm not very, so, um, definitely really interesting. I, there's so many books that I think if my sister had the time and could get back into reading, I think she would enjoy. But, like, I think my sister might like this one. But I think now she just can't get back into reading as much anymore. Or if she reads books, there's only, like, certain kinds of books that she'll read. And, like, she won't read the way she would back in school, like, in the school. See, there I go using the word like. It's, it's so hard not to say like when you're comparing things or talking about how something was before. But she, you know, she has kids now and has a job and is taking care of her own house and, you know, and Ryan has to work. And you know is another phrase people use a lot, that I use a lot, is a lot, people say a lot. I, like, I always am trying to be aware of how I'm, how I'm speaking. That's why I use the word speak instead of talk. But if I'm just talk if I'm just interacting with my friends, then yeah, I won't always be so. So is another one. <laughs> See, I, it's just so hard not to say those words. And, you know, I admire people the way they spoke back then. So enough of my of that. So I'm gonna read that tomorrow. And then I'm gonna read a little bit more. And I think what I might do. Let's see, what time is it? 8.25. So what I might do for the next two and a half hours, um, I think what I'm going to, or maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll wait until 11 or something. Well, no, probably the next two and a half hours. I'm probably at 10. I should go ahead and read. But I'm going to read a little bit more of this. Um, the Counts of Monte Cristo. And the good news is I can say with, that I've read some new stuff. And Don Edmund has found the treasure. Finally. So he and the smugglers, they do some traveling, do some smuggling and all that. And then he finally, out of, um, when, pure coincidence, um, there's, there's another phrase, like, as fate, something that kind of means the same thing as fate, I think. Um, he is able to get, they end up going to the, Count them the Isle of the Isle of Monte Cristo. Oh, there's a. I wish. I'll, of course, I think I'll think about that word. I'm trying to think of later, like when I'm in bed or something. I should I'll probably write. I should probably write it down. But um. So he goes off on his own to find the treasure. He gets to the grotto, but it's kind of difficult, and he can't easily access it. And he doesn't want it. He doesn't want the smugglers to know his new friends to know yet. So he kind of pretend he feigns an injury and persuades them to you know go do what they normally do and just leave him here and then come back in a few days. And because they already they like Edmund and they appreciate his help because he's an experienced sailor, they you know decide to leave and listen to take him at his word and that they and they and they do end up coming back. But while they're gone, he goes into the cave where the treasure is, explores the grotto, and finds the treasure. And then, after he's found the tre- and well, after he's found the smugglers return, and Jacopo, he asks him to go do him a favor and check and find out anything he can about his father, see if his father's still alive and what's going on with him, and also track down, see where Mercedes is. Well, he's kind of, I don't know what he was doing. I think he was kind of investigating the island and stuff like that. Um. Oh, no, he leaves him. I'm trying to remember what happened, what he was doing. Well, Jacopo was finding out about his, his, about his father and Mercedes. I 
guess he takes care of some legal stuff and um, works with, finds that information he can and starts his process of creating this new identity, I guess, I, guess, I think. And I mean, there's so much detail in the word, in the, in the word, so much going on in the story, like little details and description that it's, sometimes it's hard to remember everything. You almost have to write it down. And I definitely, with a book like this, you definitely need to take notes. Um, um, is another one you use a lot. I use a lot, and I'm sure a lot of other people use that word. So, Jekyll returns and tells him the horrible news that his father is dead and Mercedes is, Mercedes is gone. She has returned to Catalans, I guess. And so, he, and that's, and I think he gives, oh, oh, I remember what he was doing. That's right. He goes to, um, he, he goes to, uh, he gave Jaguar some of his, tre a little bit of the treasure, I think, you know, to pay him to be kind of his manservant, I think. And or at least maybe I'm thinking, maybe I'm just thinking about the movie. Um, and he goes to check on the people and his, you know, like, the, his father's landlord. He goes to find him and that guy is gone. He and his family uprooted to move somewhere else. I think, is that it? He goes to find out what's going on, like, all the people he left behind. Yeah. I think that's it. That's what he was doing. So, now the next chapter is called The Inn of Point du Gard. So, oh, I think this is where Card... Carduce is in. That's where he works now because he went to an inn. And I guess he became a landlord to at an inn. So I was just thinking. I really like. I was just thinking. I love watching um, um books and things. She does like. She's been doing a read along in the of Bleak House, and I like again. I have a problem where I get a little obvious of how skilled and how eloquent sounding some of my favorite booktubers are. But I just seem to stumble when I try to do that. And I know, and yes, before anyone, if anyone comments, I, I know that I need to, I can't copy anyone else. I need to just be myself. But I wish I could at least sound a little more eloquently on these videos. Um, but, yeah, this is, you know, There's, I think. So it, it's kind of funny that because these guys are essentially pirates, and I guess that kind of shows how low Dante has has become. That he's willing to be friends with these guys because now he's lived he's lived in the prison for most of his life, you know, for a lot of his life now. He's like. I think he's 24 and he was 19 when he ended up in prison, if I remember correctly. So now he's seen the low, the lower, the scum, the world, the, the bottom feelers, the people that aren't, that the rich look down on, and they're now part of his life, which I think probably you could say has made him more humble and down to earth. Not that he wasn't before. I mean, we didn't get much of his life before, actually. We just know that he was a happy-go-lucky guy, had a beautiful woman that he was going to marry. He And he was just a nice, all-around nice guy. I mean, he didn't, he didn't always like danglers, but he wouldn't, I don't think he would like punish danglers. You know, danglers would deserve it. But now being in prison, it's very sad that now that he has been in prison, he's, it has really affected him to the point that he's a completely different person. I mean, there's still that part of him inside that's good and kind-hearted, but now it's like, and it probably, I can probably, and I admit, I probably see this a lot more after having watched the movie, which I think really helps. I think with the classics, I think you could get away with seeing the movie first. 
an on-screen adaptation first to get, understand what the plot, especially with the way people wrote back then. Like, so many words, so many descriptions, and sometimes it's hard for you to get into the story because there's so many describing, so much description describing how character is feeling, what they're thinking, you know, what, what the setting and what they're looking at, what they're doing, and all that. All that's, you know, so many... That you almost drown in the word, you can almost drown in the words, or and you basically like I did with. I hate to say it, forgive me for saying this, but you know, with persuasion, there was so much, so many words describing the character's thoughts and feelings and what they were doing that it was like I couldn't. I glossed over every a lot of things that might have been. I don't know if they were important or not, but I just. It got to the point where towards the end, I admit, I ended up, like, skipping a chapter. Because it was like, okay, this can't be that important. And they're, what, I mean, we already know that, like, this character is an asshole. You know, that Mr. Elliot's not that great. We learned that he basically is a jerk to, to, um, to the family. And he doesn't really care about them. And I know it's going to end up happy. Um, but I would be curious what, I would love to hear a view from someone like Steve Donahue on Persuasion, so that maybe, or Britta Bowler, for instance, I think maybe they can enlighten me on the story and what I missed just by reading it only once. I mean, maybe one day I'd like to read them when I'm old, but I'm just, plus it doesn't, I prefer a story like this, where there's, there's political intrigue and there's, there's, revenge and stuff like that not just yes i like romance but i want more of this so let's see what else? what else so it's but either way it's very interesting that dante's how much prison changes him um, which i think i imagine it would be true because you have to be pretty tough and cold-hearted to survive in prison you know they make it you know you're like, you could either, you know, you're in there for a long time and people aren't going to be nice to you. And you have to be pretty tough and smart. You can't be someone who's sensitive. Because the prison, I imagine it could break you. You know, if you're not strong enough. And I think despite, you know, despite what the people like Danglers and Ferdinand, their opinions on Dantes, I think he's just a lot stronger than they give him credit for. And I, I'm looking forward to when we get to the actual part where he gets his revenge and punishes the three people. Like Villafort, Danglers, and Ferdinand. The three people that kind of put him in prison in the first place. And now he's found the treasure! And I can't wait, and, you know, so he'll be able to get revenge! I mean, he'll be ri he'll be able to live a rich... And I feel so... It's so it's so sad that his father. I did not like that his father, but you know that was very heartbreaking that his father had had died. You know, it just broke my heart that his dad died. He broke. You know that his father. He didn't get to see his son free. Again. And just so heartbreaking. Oh my goodness. So I'm on two more and then I can't believe there's so many things you know, so much is in this that wasn't in the movie. We also, and I like that we get more, and we're also going to get more about Villefort's relationship, like, with his father. Like, we know, you know, of course, and the, the movie just has it where, yes, it introduces the problem of that Villefort's father is a Bonapartist. So, yeah, we, in that, he convinces Ferdinand to make, he makes a deal with Ferdinand that... You know, I will put this guy in jail for you if you get rid of my father, essentially. 
and like I said, I only know that by what, having watched the movie, but I'm kind of curious what, what the, um, what's gonna, how it's going to come about in the book, and are they going to, are we going to get like a flashback, or like are we going to actually get a chapter with that is that scene where they're negotiating? Although I think there was more to it than that. I'm wondering, I can't, but what I'm probably going to do tonight at 10 is, I'm going to read a little bit more, maybe, I'm going to try to read four chapters of this tonight so I can have more to talk about when I talk about this book again, but what I need to, so basically what I need to do when you get in the habit of taking notes. That's basically what I need to do. I mean, I say that, but I never do it. Although I have started to do it. Knock on wood. And I don't know. I need to get back to my Stephen King project. Like, I don't know. Like, I need to read a little more of The Sam, but I also need to read Revival and The Shining. I need to get back into that. I think those two I might bring with me when we go to Virginia. I'm so glad that I get to go to Virginia. But I think, but... I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, like I said, I'm going to try to get four chapters done, and I'm going to read a little bit more tomorrow, and I think I'm going to, I'm going to try to do kind of like what Books and Things does, where she, I wish I knew her first name, um, she's probably said before, I just don't remember, I'm not good with names, but I'm going to try to do what she does with Bleak House, I want to discuss this as I'm reading it. And I hope you, and, and I hope you guys are, I hope it's something that you guys are interested in. So I'm going to I'm going to stop talking now and end this video right here. So if you guys like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and click subscribe if you have not. And I hope as always you are enjoying your reading and I will talk to y'all later. All right, bye.